In this example, let's evaluate the antiderivative of the rational function x plus 2 over x cubed minus 2x squared plus x. Now, we, we're going to do this using the technique of partial fraction decomposition. We should mention that the integrand is a proper rational function, so polynomial division is not necessary here. Uh, but we'll notice that the denominator is not factored. Uh, that's a very rude thing to do to someone. Uh, but anyways, we'll just proceed to factor it, right? Whenever you try to factor anything, look for common divisors. Like notice x squared, x, x cubed, x squared, and x all have a common factor of x. So factor that out. You're left with x squared minus 2x plus 1. Now for me, I can recognize that x squared minus 2x plus 1 is a perfect square trinomial. That is, it factors as x minus 1 quantity squared. And I can see that because the first term x squared is a perfect square. The last term plus 1 is a perfect square. And if you take their square roots, x and 1, and multiply them together, uh, which is just x, the middle term is double that, so 2x. Uh, that is, I'm just trying to utilize this factorization. If you have a plus b squared, this equals a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So you can use that to help you out here, or just the usual factors. I need uh, the usual way of factorization. I need factors of 1 that have to be negative 2. You take negative 1 and negative 1. Uh, so... This, you'll notice in this example that the, the common denominator, it has a repeated, uh, a repeated root. So there's this x minus 1 that shows up twice. How does this affect the template of the partial fraction decomposition? Turns out it has a big impact on it. x cubed uh, minus 2x squared plus x right here. Now, because we have an x in the denominator, we're going to need a factor that looks like a over x. All right? And as for the next one, because we have x minus 1, we might be tempted to do the following. We take b over x minus 1, and we take c over x minus 1. This doesn't quite work, though, because if you look for the least common denominator here, your least common denominator is just going to be x times x minus 1. You don't get x minus 1 twice um, in this situation. I like to sort of compare this to like if you have roommates who are looking for a pizza, they want to order a pizza together, but you know, the college students don't always have tons of money. And so therefore, instead of buying multiple pizzas, they can only buy one pizza. The three roommates, what toppings should they get? Well, one person wants pepperoni on their pizza. The other person wants bacon on their pizza. And this one person's like, yeah, I want bacon too. Well, if someone wants pepperoni, and two people want bacon. It doesn't mean we get a pepperoni double bacon pizza. It just means we get a, a, a pepperoni bacon pizza. Put them together right there. Um, so in order to get an x minus 1 squared in the denominator, one of these factors has to be squared. We don't actually need the second one exactly. But this also kind of violates one of the assumptions we used before, right? Um, because in order to make this thing work, we know that the fractions have to be proper fractions. And if your denominator is x minus 1, like you see right here, then the numerator actually could be non-constant. If your denominator is quadratic and you're proper, that means the numerator could actually be a linear polynomial, bx plus c. And that's like, yikes. Uh, how do you fix something like that? Well, it turns out if you take this perspective, that's not the best thing to do. Because after all, our goal of decomposing is to integrate it. How do we how do we choose a template that's going to be favorable for integration? So it turns out with one small tweak, we can actually make this a lot more easy. So instead of saying x, take instead of taking bx plus c, we're going to take bx minus 1 plus c, uh, like so. And so you might ask, why is that, why is that an improvement? Well, because we don't know what b and c are, they're unspecified constants. It's a constant, but we don't know what they are yet. Like we've done with antiderivatives so many times, these unspecified constants are gelatinous cubes that typically they'll just devour everything that's near them. But in this case, our gelatinous cube is now going to be vomiting up all of the stuff that's been eaten over the last several minutes. Much like in Spirit Away when No Face eats his medicine, right? If, if you've seen the movie before, you know exactly what I'm describing right now. We actually want our cube to start puking up some information. So we actually can replace this instead with a bx minus 1 plus c. This bx minus 1 plus c is, is equally generic to the bx plus c because we don't actually know what b and c are yet. This has the convenience that when we break up the fraction, the second one, we get this bx minus 1 over x minus 1 squared 
plus c over x minus 1 squared. There's not a whole lot of simplification you go in the second fraction, sorry, the third fraction, but the second one you can. There's an x minus 1 that cancels. And upon canceling, you see that your template's going to look like a over x plus b over x minus 1, just one of them. And then there's a c over x minus 1 squared. And so this temp template right here will be extremely general. That is, um, we, can, we can find out what a, b, and c are in this situation. So there's no unnecessary assumptions. But we've also constructed a template for which it'll be favorable for integration that we'll see in just a moment. Now, that this happens because we have a repeated x minus 1. If we had like actually like x minus 1 to the 10th power, what this means is we're going to have a d over x minus 1 cubed. We'll have a e over x minus 1 to the 4th. And we continue on this pattern until we get up to the 10th power. You're going to get 1 for each power going from 1 up to the power that you're, you have here. So I'm going to go back here. Uh, we only have to do a square. Now at this moment, we're going to simplify this creature. Uh, multiply both sides by x cubed minus 2x squared plus x. That is to say, multiply both sides by x times x minus 1 squared. We do that over here as well, x times x minus 1 squared. Now remember, x times x minus 1 squared is just the factorization of the original denominator. They all cancel out entirely, leaving us with an x plus 2. Now when you distribute onto the three partial fractions here, do pay attention here. For the first one, a over x, the x will cancel and will be left with a times x minus 1 squared. For the second one, an x minus 1 will cancel. So we're going to get b times x times x minus 1. There was two x minus 1, so only one of them canceled. So we're still left with 1. And then finally, the x minus 1 squares will cancel. And we're left with c times x. All right? And so now we have the following situation. And we have two strategies that we could use to try to solve this thing. First, we could try multiplying everything out and setting up a system of equations. If you do that on the right-hand side, you'll end up with a times x squared minus uh, 2x plus 1. You'll end up with a b times x squared minus x, and you'll have a cx. And so this is supposed to equal x plus 2. And so if you combine like terms, um, if we consider the quadratic term, uh, the quadratic term on the right hand on the left hand side is zero. On the right hand side, you get an a and a b. Uh, if you consider the x term on the left hand side, it has a coefficient of one. On the right hand side, you get a negative two a minus b plus c. And then if you look at the constant term uh, on the left hand side, you get a two. On the right hand side, you get just an a from there. And so you could solve the system of equations. Notice right here. Right here, you get a equals 2. That's really nice. If you substitute that in right here, you're going to see that b is negative 2. And then you have to plug those into here. b is negative 2. a is 2. So you're going to get negative 4 plus 2, which is negative 2. You end up with c being also negative 2. Did I do, one? I do, that, did I do that one right? Uh, I'm sorry. That, that should be a, a 3. Like so. And so from there, solving the system of equations, we can see that our partial fraction decomposition x plus 2 over um, our denominator x times x minus 1 squared. Uh, this turned out to be 2 over x. That was our a. Then we got uh, minus 2, sorry, minus 2 over x minus 1, and then plus 3 over x minus 1 squared. I kind of skirted over the details of C there, but if you plug in the numbers and solve for it, uh, you get the following. You should get a three there. Uh, and so that the, the system of equations, I actually think worked out really nicely here. You might be intimidated. It's like, oh no, there's three equations, three unknowns. But I mean, this one turned out really nice. A equals two. It works out super, super nice here. But let's say you don't want to use systems of equations. What if you want to use this technique of annihilation? That is an alternative, right? In which case, how do you choose annihilators? Well, one annihilator to choose will be x equals zero because that will annihilate the C 
and it'll annihilate the b as well. If you use x equals zero, you're gonna get zero plus two, which is two on the left-hand side. This will equal a times zero minus one squared, which is a times negative one squared, which is just equal to a. And you see this agrees with what we did in the system approach. So a equals two. That's pretty nice. Um, another good choice for annihilation would be x equals one. Because if you choose x equals one, it'll annihilate the a, it'll annihilate the b, in which case the left-hand side, you get one plus two equals three. The right-hand side, you then end up with everything got annihilated except for C times one, which is just a C. And so we see that C equals three, like we saw over here as well. Now, the problem here though, is that in terms of annihilation, that's all that we have here. If we, if we choose zero, we're done. If we choose one, we're done. Uh, there's no other annihilating values, right? We didn't ever figure out what B is here. So how does one proceed with this technique of annihilation if you use up all the roots? Uh, well, one idea is you could, you could, we actually know what A and C are now, so you could plug in that A equals two, and you could plug in that C equals three. So if you take that approach, you're gonna get that X plus two equals two times X minus one squared plus b times x times x minus one. And then we get a, uh, what did we have above? We had c times x. So you get a three x like so. Uh, then you can proceed to combine like terms because there's a bunch of constant or x terms you can do. You can combine like terms, uh, do some division, things like that. Um, it can get a little bit messy. You could take the derivative right now also to kind of get rid of some stuff. Uh, you could solve for b. But in this situation, as there's only one unknown left, we just have to pick something else, like pick x equals two or x equals negative one, something simple, um, and just go from there. Um, if we plug in two, the right, the left hand side is a four. We're gonna get two times two minus one, which is one. Uh, we're gonna get b times two times two minus one plus three times two. Uh, so we end up with four is equal to two plus two b plus six. 2 and 6 together is 8. Subtract 8 from both sides. We get negative 4 equals 2b. Divide by 2, you end up with b equals uh, negative 2, like we saw earlier. So this is sort of the trade-off, right? The, the annihilation can get some stuff pretty quickly, but when you have repeated factors, some of the other stuff is going to be hard to find, and it kind of boils down to solving the system of equations. So, uh, so because of this, I do kind of emphasize that we do want to be used to solving the systems of equations because with the system of equations we can solve uh, the, these partial fractions typically turn into a system of equations eventually if not just starting from the beginning and the system is usually not that hard to find so like we mentioned earlier if we're integrating x plus 2 over x cubed minus 2x squared plus x dx by our partial fraction decomposition we found out the following we found out that the AX, the A over X became a two over X DX. We can do that one. Um, then we had a negative integral of two over X minus one DX, followed up finally with an integral of three over X minus one squared DX. And like I said, the reason we chose the template the way we did is because this should lead to a simple antiderivative. The first two are ones we've seen before, this, that is the way we've seen the type before. 2 over x, its antiderivative will be 2 times the natural log of x, absolute value of x. The second one is negative 2 times the natural log of x minus 1. A basic u substitution works there. But it turns out a u substitution also works on the last one. If we take u to be x minus 1, and then du, it will just equal dx. This thing would look like the integral of 3 over u squared du or you probably prefer it as three times the integral of u to the negative two du. We can use the power rule. And by the power rule, we would raise the power to be negative one. We have to divide by that power. So we're gonna get negative three. Uh, I'm gonna write it as a fraction here. So we're gonna get negative three over x minus one plus a constant. So with a nice u substitution, we can get some anti or anti derivatives who are natural logs. We get one that is just a power rule which isn't so bad at all. And so if you have a repeated factor, you have to be a little more careful on your template. 
every for every power in the denominator, you need to have a fraction there. So in this case, we had a square, so we had a first power and a second power. If you had to take something to the fourth power, you'd have a partial fraction for the first, second, third, and fourth powers. You get all of those. So then once you find the template, which you're probably gonna have to solve using systems of linear equations, or you could try to use this technique of annihilation. Um, well, as you're trying to solve this the, the, and find this partial fraction decomposition, that is, I should say, when you have the partial fraction decomposition, the antiderivatives are going to be pretty simple. Those fractions which have a linear denominator, their antiderivatives will be natural logs. Those with a repeated root, use substitution just will give us the power rule, in which case we get another rational function like that. And so once you have the partial fraction decomposition, the antiderivative is pretty slick to find. The hard part, as you see in these videos, is actually finding the partial fraction decomposition, which uses these techniques from algebra, either solving systems of linear equations or eliminate uh, this annihilation technique of some kind. That brings us to the end of lecture 14, but that will not be the end of our discussion of partial fraction decompositions. Um, I want to do some more examples in the next lecture about some different templates. Because as the template changes, it can dramatically ch change the algebraic calculation. And there are a few more subtleties we're going to want to see in the next lecture. Stay tuned for that one. Uh, and I'll see you then.